We begin our forum today with a keynote address by Juan Carlos Bedimo Calderon, Ecuador's Minister of Energy and Renewable Natural Resources. Chairing our first session is Jose Luis Manzano, the chairman of Integra Capital, a co-sponsor of this forum. He is also a board member of the Institute of the Americas. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jose Luis Manzano to our virtual stage to kick off this forum. Uh, Jose Luis, take it away. Thank you very much, Richard, and good morning, everybody. Here with time. Uh, Minister, thank you very much with, with that. Uh, for the Institute, uh, Ecuador is a, is a big hope in the region. Ecuador has navigated through long time with the stable currency framework, uh, showing commitment to democracy. It has had bumps, but is still committed to making the country work in an inclusive democracy, sustaining healthy, normal, rational economic policies, uh, and in the search of uh, social inclusion uh, with a big role um, of participation of the private sector, the international investment, and the, the leadership of the Ecuadorian government. So, Minister, for us, it's a big honor to have you here. The Minister is well known in the industry. For those that don't know him, Minister is an industry expert with a long um, prof professional standing in the industry, in the energy industry, and as a public servant. I think uh, his continuity in the area permit also think in stability in the policies and in the bet from outside of the country for the country and from Ecuadorians to, to bet on the country. So minister, we I'll give you the floor and put two questions for you to elaborate around. The first one is what are your challenges in terms of the 2030, 2050 goals on environment? What are your challenges in managing energy transition and energy shortcuts or needs for the Ecuadorian today, present, challenging present? And what are the investment opportunities for foreign investors and for Ecuadorian investors in, in oil and gas, in mining, in renewable energy, in energy transition? So we'll give you the floor. You have 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then we'll leave you with our audience so they have a chance to ask you and get your guidance. Minister, thank you very much for being with us. We leave you the floor. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you here. And I would like to apologize to make my presentation in Spanish. Sorry about that, but I guess you have this interpretation uh, translation button. So I guess uh, everybody would understand what I'm trying to tell everybody in the world about Ecuador and the oil and sector opportunities for private investment. That's the key word. That's to us, the key word is private investment. As you may know, the government, the government of Ecuador doesn't have enough money to invest in oil, energy, and um, mining. Uh, probably you, you know that uh, this ministry has uh, a relationship with hydrocarbons, mining, and uh, energy. So it's a huge challenge for me that I have to deal with these three industries and give everybody the, this message. We need the private sector investment. We need money from the investors. Now is the time for the investors. So if, if anybody help me with the presentation, please. Let me start with a long-term vision about the, our policies and what we have done in this first 100 days of this new government in Ecuador. It's called Perspectivas de la Politica. It's called our energy perspective, and this is our government vision. So what do we want to do in the three areas that we manage at our agency? To use resources more efficiently in a way that is sustainable, responsible, and environmentally friendly. This is a government mandate that we have to respect at our ministry, and of course, to have a respectful 
relationship with all of the communities within our area of influence. If I may, I'm going to repeat our government slogan. Since it took office on May 24th of this year, under the leadership of our new president, what is our goal? We want more Ecuador in the world and more of the world in Ecuador. So that is for the whole of Ecuador, not just my agency, but anything that has to do with Ecuador and its economy, exports, foreign trade, new possibilities for international trade agreements, new possibilities uh, of being in contact with other countries. And proof of that, and it's worthwhile mentioning it because it is something that we are very proud of in our country, is our vaccine program. In just 100 days of the new administration, 9 million people have been vaccinated in our country. And that was part of what we called the diplomacy of vaccines. So if we can achieve something like that in such a short time and with such effectiveness, then why not in other areas? For example, hydrocarbons, power generation, mining. In order to do that, we need the presence and participation of investors, private investors, whether domestic or international. Next, please. So what have we developed when it comes to oil and mining? There have been two executive decrees. On the left, you see executive decree number 95, and on the right-hand side, executive decree number 151. Executive decree 95 sets clear policies for the oil industry in our country. So now we have a true north to aim at. We have goals to achieve, challenges to overcome, but we have the commitment of our ministry to effectively contribute to the development of the country and therefore to the well-being of every Equatorian citizen. Next, please. So very quickly, to not tire you out, let's look at the opportunities in the hydrocarbon sector under our purview. Next. We have proposed, to get into some details, uh, certain projects, as you see on the left-hand column, that have to do with increasing, for example, a maritime terminal to be able to store LP gas or natural gas in order to set for power generation. And then we have the Esmeraldas refinery which was built some years ago, and we require private investment in order to have a public-private partnership so that we can enhance the capacity of that refinery and modernize it that can deliver fuels that meet international regulations. We anticipate an investment of about $2.7 billion on a 20-year concession contract. We are about to launch a third uh, round of bids to allow private investment under, again, a partnership contract. And here I would like to spend a few more minutes because there's something significant about this. The contract that we would use for these partnerships moving forward is one that is modern, that is balanced, that is fair for the parties involved, and that it guarantees, above all, the legal certainty for investors. 
of course, in this partnership, government would keep a percentage and the private investment firm would keep another. And we have two examples of what we want to do in the short term. We're going to do uh, an RFP for the South eastern portion of ecuador and for another we have another for a field called intracampos 3 which we are planning to launch on the first trimester of 2022 next please now moving to the energy sector on screen you can see the breakdown of uh potential investment opportunities in power generation in Ecuador. So we see the technical uh, potential that Ecuador wants to maximize in hydropower and wind power, geothermal, solar. Let's not forget that in Ecuador, 90 to 92 percent of power is hydropower. We are developing some wind farms. There's a significant potential for geothermal. And of course, we are fully promoting renewable, clean generation such as solar and wind. Next, please. Now, what we see on this slide is how we have adapted our power master plan in Ecuador. We have updated and revised the plan. And what have we done? Look, in 2024, we had uh, forecast 220 megawatts of renewables. Yes. So this is a renewable generation. Solar, wind, hydropower and biomass generation. And you can see the breakdown on screen, but the significant uh, part of this is that we are allowing private investment in renewables together with our ministry so that we can develop the projects our country needs and that would whet the appetite of investors. Next, please. So what can we offer in power generation to the private sector? Highlighted in a yellow orange, we have 500 megawatts of renewable generation that we could allow private investment in, but then we have 400 megawatts in combined cycle generation and it could grow by 600 additional megawatts. And then we have a transmission line to be able to provide services to the oil industry in Ecuador, which as you know, is very important because it significantly contributes to our country's economy. And the oil industry does not have sufficient power generation. So it is important to supply that energy in order to achieve some of our goals. First, to replace the current use of fossil fuels with clean energy. And second, of course, to signal to the world that we are transitioning from fossil fuels to clean energies that will reduce a GHG emissions. We have below other projects, Cardenillo, Santiago, Sopladora, and they have the power you see on screen, on screen and that could also allow private investment. Next, please. Now, I would like to give you an example of what we have done in Galapagos. The world knows where the Galapagos Islands are and the importance of these islands. Environmentally speaking, uh, in particular, the Galapagos traditionally used fossil fuels to generate electricity 
with fixed uh, power plants and we are replacing the use of diesel in particular for power generation in the Galapagos. We created a project recently, uh, which is called Conolofos, and which is solar energy production to supply the Santa Cruz and Baltras Islands in the Galapagos archipelago, again, to replace the use of diesel for on-site generation. We have 40.9 megawatts of battery storage and 14.8 megawatts of power generation. So these are some of the new things that Ecuador is doing when it comes to clean renewable energy, particularly in environmentally sensitive areas such as the Galapagos. Next, please. Our non-conventional renewable energy block that I share on screen here is our schedule of investments so that projects can go into operation by 2024. On the right-hand side, you see a breakdown of uh, the how much would be hydroelectric power, how many uh, would be wind energy, solar, biomass. And the significant part of this that I want to share with you is that the initial investment estimates are about $950 million to develop the projects you see now on screen. Next, please. Ecuador has a very promising future when it comes to mining. It is no surprise that all the largest mining companies are present in Ecuador. On the left-hand side, you see companies in the country such as BHP, Fortescue, Anglo-American, we have Grupo Mexico, we have Newcrest, we have First Quantum, these are high-ranking, renowned companies around the world who have mining interests within Ecuador. Now, the companies on the right-hand side, like Codelco, Tongling, Nonferros, London, Hancock, Solaris, are also companies that are already operating in our country and in some cases are doing uh, exploration with approximate with an approximate investment of $800 million. So what I'm trying to convey with this is the firm purpose of Ecuador to develop a new age of mining and discovery of new fields and mineral mining, because we have very significant reserves where we could allow private investment. Next, please. This map shows the location of significant, significant excuse me, uh, projects in Ecuador. Uh, perhaps you had never seen a map of Ecuador before, but this is just to show you where in the country these projects are. And we're talking about private investment in mining. And these private investment projects are located geographically in the area you see within Ecuador. Next, please. Now, the projects you see now, we call second generation projects because of the timing of these projects. So we expect them to come into operation in the next few years and they're distributed throughout central Ecuador and initial investments uh, indicate that this should be world class investments. Some of these reserves could make us uh, one of the 10 largest uh, mining projects in the world in gold, 
silver and bronze. So let me give you an example of what mining could bring to Ecuador. Right now, we only have two active projects, one for gold and one for copper. This year, we're hoping to close with 1.6 billion in exports, in contrast with last year, where we had only 900 million. Just to give you an idea of the growth and the importance of the mining industry in our country, these two projects today represent 67% of mining exports in our country. And today, mining represents the fourth largest industry in Equatorian exports. And again, this year, we could move up to, it could move up to our third largest export. Next, please. Now, what can we offer in our mining portfolio? This is what you see on screen. We have a few projects. I don't want to get into too much detail, so I don't take up any much time, but I just want you to see how they are distributed throughout Ecuador and that have very interesting potential for private investment. Where, of course, you will be received by my ministry with everything that the mining industry would need today. Next, please. This is just to illustrate where our mining exports are going. Number one is China, then we have Switzerland, and then the US. Switzerland is gold, China mostly copper, and the US combination of gold and copper. And with only three destinations and two projects, we'll still be able to close out the year with 1.6 billion in exports in this industry. Next, please. This is an interesting slide because it shows that it isn't only mining itself that would be interesting for the private sector. We are thinking of a gold refinery. We are also thinking of conveyance pipelines for mining products as well as a mining train to be able to deliver the mining products to our ports for export. And of course, everything mining companies needs when it comes to technology and services, because mining companies are very demanding in this context. Next, please. Okay, I was asked to speak about our bilateral relations with the US. And I bring you, in my opinion, very good news. We, through the U.S. Embassy, have been in permanent contact with the U.S. to carry out the activities and tasks for uh, the technical assistance that the U.S. can provide for our energy-related activities. We have received technical assistance, uh, for example, with consulting for our organic law, as well as being able to increase private investment in energy transmission. Next, please. And the assistance, as you can see here, has led to concrete actions. Uh, a report on private investment recommendations for competitive bidding, trade rules for cross-border energy trade, because uh, the regional and uh, Andino network is very significant for neighboring countries, so cross-border energy trade is significant. And so we have had some technical trainings of our staff in that regard. Next, please. When it comes to project structuring, through technical assistance, uh, we'll be asking for some consulting help in structuring what we call PPS, which are 
selected public projects. So projects that were going to launch into the market for PPP, for public-private partnerships. We have the combined cycle block, non-conventional renewable energy block, and the transmission, the Northeast transmission system, which I was talk talking about the last slide. Next, please. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I want to uh, explain what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, has been helping with in Ecuador. As you may know, in Ecuador, we have a project called Coca Sinclair. It, this is a project that was built some years ago and started operations in 2018. And because of the natural flow of the river, we have been experiencing regressive erosion. It is a type of erosion that happens upstream, which is unique. And the technical requirements are difficult, so it needs the collaboration of people with great expertise and experience to find a good solution in order to mitigate or minimize the effects of this regressive erosion. And through the U.S. Embassy, to that end, we have sought out the support and technical assistance of the Army Corps of Engineers. They've visited Ecuador twice now, and next week I am pleased to share Next week, they will be coming back to provide technical assistance for a probable solution to this regressive erosion program that will allow us in the short term to at least have some preliminary solution alternatives. This again uh, has been made possible by an MOU between the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the power um, company in Ecuador called Select, as you see on screen. And I think this is a tangible example of the mutual cooperation opportunities between the U.S. and Ecuador. And in this case in particular, to try to find technical solutions for a serious issue. As you may imagine, a 1500 megawatt power plant that, that could uh, face the erosive, um, regressive erosion. Next, please. Okay. Uh, we'll close uh, with the following. Uh, I've been trying to keep it short, and I hope I didn't skip too many important topics, but. Um, and I close with the following uh, yesterday, no, day before yesterday, with the U.S. Grains Council, we signed an MOU whose purpose is to have the U.S. Grains Council help us find the mechanisms and initiatives to improve the quality of our fuels and the use of biofuels in Ecuador. Today, Ecuadorian fuel needs to be improved when it comes to quality so that it can meet international standards. And in order to do that, we want to use biofuels to improve um, quality and improve its octane rating. And so the U.S. Grains Council will be, for example, talking to us about how to produce ethanol in our country. Now, the MOU was uh, signed again just two days ago, so I am pleased to announce that. This is technical assistance that without a doubt, without a doubt, will be very useful to control the fuel quality within our country, but also to improve air quality by reducing um, air emissions. Again, uh, I'll close with that, and I will gladly answer any questions, comments, um, or anything else you would uh, like to uh, ask me about from this uh, very, very uh, short presentation, trying to summarize what we do at my ministry. 
And as you may imagine, um, it has huge economic transcendence for our country's economy. Well, thank you so much, uh, Juan Carlos. We enjoyed your presentation. Um, we have um, a question, and, I've, and I'm going to lead in with a with a couple questions. Uh, first, um, you know, you've you've talked about some very ambitious mining projects uh, throughout the country, as well as oil and gas um, uh, production over the next uh, few years under the last administration. What um, steps are you going to take to address the issue of indigenous rights? Because many of these projects are in communities that um, um, can have at times been contentious um, with other projects and want to see what the ministry is doing to address some of those issues so that there are win-wins and that the community address issues are addressed and projects can move forward and investors ultimately have some security going forward. Muy buena pregunta, muy buena pregunta, Richard. A very good question. Okay. The development of industry cannot be accomplished if we do not have a very good relationship with our indigenous communities. If we do not get a social license to work with this indigenous group, no industry, hydrocarbon mining or whatever could not develop their work if they cannot work hand in hand with the nearby communities. And in order to do this right, is, uh, we're doing some things. We're working on a law that's um, called a previous consultation law so that we can develop all of these communication and social processes with the industries within these communities as a previous requirement. But once this industry is already at the geographic side, having a good relationship with these communities would be the government's responsibility to see that they do this. And we they have to make sure that companies within their budgets they have to include economy, uh, economic health with these communities. Four important areas that I would like to mention. Health, um, environment and cleaning, communication, and training and educational programs. And I would say that if we cover these four areas, we could have a good relationship with these communities because that's what they're asking for to the state and from the companies that would work near them. We have another question. Um, um, in the last administration, a major natural gas uh, and gas uh, power project was developed, but the bidding was delayed. Any news on the projects and more broadly on the role of natural gas and LNG in Ecuador? We, we know that we have gas associated to oil protection in the Amazon zone. The state company has developed some uh, generation projects and let's say that they have not done it at a large scale because we don't have enough gas in order to develop high generation projects. But there are some things that I have been uh, that we have been doing to transform our energy so that we could replace the use of diesel in the oil activity. But in the coast of Ecuador at the Pacific Ocean, we have a, a natural gas field which is called Amistad or friendship. And this field needs foreign investment for its development because right now it only produces so much cubic feet per day. And we can do two things. First, increase production through private investment and uh, the estimate budget for this uh, 280 million dollars of investment for a first phase in order to increase production because the second phase would be to replace the electric generation which is in charge of well replacing fossil fuels for 
natural gas, clean energy, using the resources from this field. And because this field is not producing the gas that we would like, if we would replace all of the generation into natural gas, we would allow um, other companies to um, deliver natural gas imported from other sources abroad. Could you give us more details about the intercampus two round and how the exploration ex activity is going in the two blocks in Intercambio Uno or Caminos, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Number one was signed in 2019, but seven exploration and export contracts were signed and the percentages are defined for the state and the private sector. That round, because of environmental issues, not because of the companies, but rather due <clears throat> to a delay on issuing um, licenses from the last administration, it could have not, it has not been able to be developed. But now, thanks to the new, um, strategies from the new administration, we have licenses to issue for the first phase for uh, the communities and the beginning of this project. So we hope that by the end of this year, we can start activities with the round Intercampus 1. As far as Intercampus 2, we're starting with the socialization phase and community participation so that we can inform about the project so that we can launch them uh, probably by the end of December or uh, at the beginning of 2022. They're in fields. So they're fields that have not been exploited. So they're intermediate uh, and so that we can they can just add their production to the infrastructure that already exists. Thank you. We have a question about the potential for uh, solar energy. Ecuador is at an ideal moment to bring the world to Ecuador and vice versa. As far as the plans of adding the 500 megawatts in solar energy, do you expect to return in through public um, bidding or within this block of 500 megawatts, what proportion do you expect to assign to the to great scale and other projects? Okay, those are a lot of questions. Okay. What we've been doing is that we define a 500 megawatt block for non-renewable non energy. What do we do? We have distributed on a first phase a percentage for hydroelectric, another for solar, and another percentage for geothermic. There's a very interesting project in the country um, in need of development. So therefore, as far as wind and solar energy, the private sector would be who would start developing and they are gonna tell us, I need to develop a project in such and such site in Ecuador. And we will tell them, well, we can, we can give you or offer you so many megawatts. And we're going to make sure that that program falls into the national program. And they will have all of the support from the ministry in this case. We have set some limits or some percentages as far as renewable en energy. But just as a quick cal calculation, I would say about 200 megawatts for hydroelectric projects, 200 for wind energy, 70 for solar, and 30 for biomass. But they're not fixed percentages. If we get more solar projects tomorrow, then the ministry will be 
focusing on their needs in order to develop their projects. Gracias. Um, we had a question, looks like from an investment banker or a consultant looking to try to learn more about the um, work that um, your ministry is going to do to structure these licitations, which can be quite complex, particularly for the LNG uh, uh, facility that you're lo looking at um, invest and having people invest in. Um, if um, if someone was interested in supporting the ministry in some way, how would they reach you or how would they reach your ministry uh, to, to lend support in this area? Um, well, for example, it is always useful to give examples in order to answer certain questions. We have a hydroelectric project that's called Soplador and it's already in operation and we're going to launch it. And this is a, a public process and we have looked for a bank in this particular case is uh, the Paddy Bass Bank in France and through their help we have been able to structure this project and by the end of this project we're going to launch the request for proposals for the private sector and obviously just as in any other part of the world for any investor what they ask for are warranties and legal security right now these i would say this mechanism mechanism through which we ensure that their investment are going to have a return we have something that we call a uh, a trust where in the first order we have the pay of the tariff that will contribute to the investment so that's the first sign that means that any money that we they get from the private sector will go towards the investors payment it means that this trust is the best way and the best sign to show that the government is going to recognize in the first place, the investor. As far as natural gas goes, we have to remind, no, we have to remember that today we're, we're seeking for natural gas investments. So the investor will have a very clear idea as to how their invested money is going to be used. And we could have uh, any initiative with the use of natural gas that will allow us to substitute other kinds of energy. So we have created a legal structure that will allowed for free exports. And then we're going to have a trust that will warranty foreign investment. So I think that with these conditions, we can offer the investors a warranty and security to invest in our country. Gracias. We had a question um, about corruption. Uh, there's been a, <clears throat> um, in past administrations, um, there've been a problem with corruption in Petro Ecuador. Want to know what the loss administration is going to do to address the issue of corruption um, at that in your um, state oil company and in general? Probably, and you did mention that I've been with this industry for quite a while now. My personal characteristic has always been uh, fighting against corruption, and Lasso's government just uh, created an executive mandate, an executive order. This is, these are not just good intentions. This is an order that, and through my vision and my behavior, I'm going to do everything in my hands and Corruption will not be negotiable or tolerable during this administration. 
whether it is from public, from the public sector or the private sector, because these are the two possibilities. We have corruption within the public sector and within the private sector. So regardless of what company uh, tries to be corrupted, we're going to be intolerable with corruption. We have taken some steps. We have a norm against corruption. And in December, we're going to have two areas from the public state company under this regulation already implemented. And that's how they're going to have to work. Gracias. Um, at this time, we're going to conclude our session. I want to give Jose Luis Manzano um, the f uh, final word. He had some um, reflections and closing remarks. So, um, Jose Luis, take it away. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, ministers, uh, your first word, I think, gave us the framework and put in, in a few words, uh, President Lasso policy and your policy for the sector. You said clearly, we need the money to develop it. this. We need private investor. From the outside, look like the administration and yourself are doing everything to secure the attention of the world the investment keeping coming, but the country as a whole in the last years also has shown the ability to even having their own struggles, maintain the currency and maintain friendliness to foreign investment. You mentioned the looming investment in, in gold and it's an example of how the investment went through in the country and stayed. So the only last comment is that we at the Institute see President's last of policies. We see your activity in the ministry as a real welcoming policy to private investment. We believe we have to be of your help uh, because this uh, courage of trying to bring develop, development and inclusiveness through market economy policies and investment is, is a big hope in the region. So Minister, the only thing we can say is congratulations. We are the Institute at an open floor for the government of Ecuador. And we are also open to the investor that need anything there. Your embassy in the US is doing a great job and the US embassy in Ecuador is committed with this process. So only congratulations and we, we hope we'll, keep, we'll have you in La Joya anytime soon. Okay. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Jose Luis. Thank everybody for the opportunity of telling you frankly and honestly about the situation in my country. This is a very hard work that we have to do. We have very important goals to accomplish and I'm not gonna be able to do it alone. I'm going to need the help of all of those people that with their goodwill are supporting our initiative and these administrations and the ministry. And among those institutions are you guys. And I will always come to you to ask for advice or to ask for your commitment in order to develop my sector and my country. Thank you again. It's been a pleasure and I'm at your service. I'm always available if you need me. Gracias. Gracias.